um, head of data submission, study the source of the blockchain, and study new patterns using the smart contracts. And what I just want to finish, I want to acknowledge this is the smart program and I guess. And thank you. I was curious about the websites that you mentioned during the inclusion exclusion <coughs> criteria. Um, can you describe what those websites were? I, I'm not familiar oh, with those. So, we have it in, uh -huh. well, based on who we do when um, selected groups, groups um, that means that and some of them were not even related to blockchain, but they just had a lot of things. But what we did is um, we only got the, the links that were listed that gave us each uh, platform. Mm -hmm. Those were the links that were the websites that were having to use. Is there any other links that you have to use? If you have no more questions, uh, I'll send you go and there we are. Thank you, everyone. My name is Rivera. Um, before the slides come out, I'm going to introduce about myself. I'm from Anikinella University. My major is uh, Information Security and Policy Management. Uh, I just finished the first year uh, there. Before I joined the program, uh, I have some years experience in business application and engineering. Um, I have a, uh, some background with the database and the database and sugar. So my uh, project is focused on the secure genome uh, database based on the homomorphic interaction. Um, Dr. John is my mentor. Thanks for his advice. So the project actually comes from a real uh, business requirement. That's from real business requirement that uh, research institute has a lot of uh, genome data, right? To share that with the researcher. But there has a problem that uh, they need to ensure a certain secure way to store and share the data. So basically, there are two requirements. The first one, they're going to use the cloud to store the data because the cloud is. Uh, the way can resolve the data volume problem as well provide some kind of lower security. And the second and most important that is these two patterns not trust each other. So it means the researcher on uh, uh, the data order only want the researchers to know those data they are interested in. I mean the data they inherit. And at the same time, the researcher don't want don't want the data owner to know what kind of data they are researching. So we call this a two pattern. And this project will focus on the one requirement we call the count query. Count query is given a, a sequence of the a table of the snake data, and uh, the researcher wants to know um, needs certain criteria, how many uh, patients can be there, how many patients are the count. <laughs> All right. This kind of mechanism faces a lot of challenges. Uh, basically, it's a performance. Three areas we can find out about. The first one is the two party competition or multi party competition have a performance problem. Even the state of art solution that we decrypt and encrypt the data is a high. Secondary is that the data is encrypted, which means it's hard to build the index. You know, just now we mentioned this. The search. Looks like very simple, it's a simple payment. But working on the real state data that we cannot build the index, so we have to do certain uh, scan the database scan to get the data we need. And the last one, the data volume is good. Uh, we look at uh, typical data, each patient has one year sleep with the calls, and we, the database at least can get 1,000 patients. So thanks for a uh, research team at the uh, University of Manitoba in Canada. They developed certain uh, new technology 
so that we make this kind of support very possible. Um, initially, um, the data the data we present in the table, but they change this mechanism that they develop a kind of tree. They develop a certain kind of tree to replace the table so that the common part, you look at this data that they have some commonality in this thing, what we come to the tree, no. So by this tree, we can save the storage space as well as that, we can do a kind of tree branch research to confirm their relationship. And the second, that solution is a certain kind of uh, security inquiry mechanism. Uh, there are two key points. The first one is the uh, homomorphic, which is a polylog uh, uh, system. This, this is a um, um, probabilistic uh, encryption mechanism because we know that we have a lot of commonality about the state data. And by introducing some kind of randomness, the re encrypt result will be different. So avoid a uh, kind of rainbow uh, table solution to encrypt the data. Secondary, that we got the Rawls uh, Gabriel circuit. So that the two parties when they do a uh, kind of the common matching, they will not they will not know they will not know each other how the data they provide as just the results. And the last one, because this paper is just on the very initial uh, stage, so it implemented in the computer web. But we look at the millions of data that I mentioned that we cannot do that in the web. We have to implement an actual database. So we find out that the graph database, which is a kind of new uh, non-relational database, would be the perfect tools to represent the, uh, the index data because uh, that's a uh, it's, it's defined for the defined relationship, so the tree structure will be perfect to meet that requirement. And we choose new project, that's an industry leader, like, people, uh, sorry, like uh, Facebook and uh, Amazon, use this uh, tools to have a relationship between your friends and those relationships. All right, but when we really implement the project, we find out there's a lot of problems in the It's really, if we don't do any improvement, or we can implement the that's not really um, practical physical. So we, I will introduce a few uh, innovation in the project. The first one is about the clean test. We know that because of the diversity of the state data, if we don't do any uh, improvement, our tree will look like that. The tree will expand very fast to expand it to so the same as the whole uh, list of operations. So we do a little bit of change. We move those state data with the common state data to the front of the tree, so that our tree is really slim, becomes slim, that will help you to improve the storage as well as the uh, search performance. Next improvement will happen on the, the search of the tree. We know that build the tree is a long time job. The search of the tree is a daily activity, so the performance is much more crucial than build the tree. Now let's look at what's the actual problem. So, for example, we need to, there's a one for the time that we need to make sure that node G is a sub node of the node 8. This looks a very simple uh, query, but we think about the half million gaps between A and G. It will take several minutes. And we consider if the tree is a southern um, patient's risk, that's not separate. So, we did a kind of new technology to help to for the, for the search. <coughs> Uh, we call it and uh, we call it prediction tag. Let me explain to you detail step by step. First one, we do a certain kind of sorting. The sorting starts from the node, uh, the root of the, uh, the tree. We give a, a at this uh, horizontal level, we give each node a sequence number. So if all the nodes belong to the same parent, it doesn't matter. We just give a sequence. But if the node for example, C and D and E and F belong to different parents, so their sequence must follow the parent sequence. So it means the sequence number of the C and D must be less than the sequence number of the E and F until the end of the tree. Now, after we finish that, we do tagging. Actually, the tagging is the range, range of the child you know. So for example, in the, the most detailed of the tree, we just put in the, put in the sequence number. But if we move above, 
For example, node A, they have two sub subbrand. So the node A will recall the range of the summary of the C and D. So which means, in this case, that node A in, uh, includes position 1, 2, node B includes position 2, 3. Because just now we did the sorting, we make sure that the, the parent node have all the position information of the child node. So now the search becomes easier. We're not necessarily to go to all the three. We just want to know, just need to know the point, uh, the, uh, the range number of the parent, child, parent node and the child node, for example. Know that when we look at the relationship between node A and the node F, uh, node G, we know that the node G is a subset of the node A, so it's a subset of this parent. And while we look at the node H and the node A, so this 3, 2, 3 is not a part of one to what, uh, CO2 what? So that's not this chart. Uh, later, I will show you the result. Actually, this will bring the query to a constant uh, time, response time, so that it depends on the three steps. Okay, but another improvement we uh, do is a really another practical problem. So in the original design, when a new patient data comes in, it will compare the node by node to see if there is any similarity and then combine to that. This works very well in, the, in terms of the very low volume of the data, but we will move to million data we found a problem will take hours. <laughs> Alright, then we find out another tools, the database tools. The native database tools are able to pump in the data in batch so it can improve the performance. So we change it this way a little bit. We load all the data first and combine the similarity of the nodes. It's a local kind of waste of time but actually you get the data I'll show you get 10 times the all right, so in the, in the whole program, we developed certain programs to make this practice possible. So we developed the program to calculate the statics, so that based on these statistics, we can re re sequence and reorder the uh, sleep data. And then we develop programs to load the data, uh, combine the common of the nodes, we can play the position tags, just I mentioned. Finally, we encrypt data and get the program to search the, search the, search the truth. So uh, let's look at finally how we did. Uh, we almost finished that. Um, so we built a database um, to do the uh, real uh, count query. So uh, we use a cloud server on the Amazon cloud. Uh, that's a very typical uh, server configuration. We uh, get the data from the uh, gen uh, gen Genome 36 project. That's a real SMB SNP data. So uh, 750 uh, K per patient, and we have 173 patients. This gave us uh, 102 million nodes in the, in the January tree. It almost take us a day to build the tree and 5.5 uh, days to build the, the uh, encryption. But anyway, that's a one-time job. Uh, let's look at the key improvement we made. The, we ordered the sequence, uh, of the, we ordered the sequence give us, uh, reduce the nodes from 127 million nodes to 119 million nodes. It is an 8 million nodes improvement. We have to show a little bit more about that. And the very important, uh, adding the prediction tag, reduce the time. Curiously, I, I just mentioned the performance depends on the depth of the tree. So the best is about one minute, the worst is one thousand minutes is not feasible. So more after that, it's just like 10 seconds flat time. Um, for the builder tree, we reduce time from 30 minutes per patient to 3.5 per patient. And the last one is another practice reason that when doing the encryption, the process, just as I mentioned, the homomorphic encryption is not really efficient. But we didn't, we're not able to improve the homomorphic encryption itself. We use multiple uh, CPUs to make the program concurrent. We use the multiple CPUs, so we get another around 10 times performance improvement. Okay, now let's look at some detail because it's related to the future improvement. So this is a tree, uh, the, the, the branch expand status. If, if we don't do anything, you can see that it jumped to the full width. We have 170 pages. Uh, it jumped to the full width initially. But after we re-sequence, re we move that at around like 50,000, the depth of 50,000, so step by step. So another analysis will show that this commonality is really depends on the number of the patients. When we have five number, uh, five patients, the common part is quite a lot. 
And we got hungry patients, it's, it's they're going to stop the going shorter and shorter. It's a common sense, but the people are so worried that if with more and more patients join, the commonality will be less. And whether this um, uh, the index tree, this, whether this index tree is sufficient enough to handle more, uh, many patients. Another uh, uh, analysis result we get that is uh, just not mentioned the very time is crucial. It's crucial. So we just uh, quantify the results. Just emphasize again, the um, result of collection tax, that's when it becomes the flex, and after that, it's a flat. Okay, okay. just want to mention that we still we find out some problem. So we uh, propose in the next phase just do some improvement. And the first one is that the index tree is really depends on the diversity of the state data. So we propose to use a hub loop, a uh, hub log type to replace the SNP data. Haplotype is a kind of correlated combination of the uh, SNP data. So, so um, we, in our preliminary design, that one haplotype can have a hundred of SNP data. So by use of haplotype data, we can reduce the depth of the tree, and as well as, at the same time, to increase the, the information carried out on a single node. So that helps to improve the encryption as well. Uh, another technology that we propose to use a pair state intersection in test of the uh, node based uh, homomorphic encryption. In that will increase two areas. The first one is the performance. And the secondary, in the old, old design, that although the SNP data is encrypted, the SNP code itself is visible to both parties. But use the homomorph, uh, sorry, use the pair state intersection, the SNP data also will be encrypted. So that's improve the security. And the secondary that is about the prediction tax. Just now, the prediction tax is working very well, but it's a limitation. Any changes to the tree of the rebuild index will take hours. So we propose to use a bitmap instead of the prediction tax. So that if new patient comes, we just need to update the bitmap and not, not require the rebuild. And, the, and the, another possible that we can do encrypt on the bitmap. If that is feasible, that will replace the whole tree technology. That will further improvement of the whole uh, system. That's almost about my presentation. And finally, sure, thanks for Dr. Jan to give me some lots of introduction about the state of art um, solution to these related topics. So um, that's a great learning experience. Thanks for uh, you said the school of medicine to give fun to give me here. And uh, the important that the University of Manitoba give us the initial solution and the implementation. And we get the uh, at the best of um, the one. And finally, the project uses a lot of open source resource uh, about the cryptography. Um, it's a really a good learning experience. Thanks, everyone. We have time for one question. <laughs> okay. What's the next step? Uh, next step, uh, we still want to, first one, we will cover that to our paper because it's really mm -hmm. some improvement. Secondary, um, I'm really excited about the, uh, just now the proposed, just the improvement we proposed, also we will bring some, hopefully we will bring some new information to the project. Thank you again. Sienna Chan. I'm a undergrad studying computer science at Johns Hopkins University. My project is on trustworthy containers and generating proofs with machine learning. My team includes me and my mentor Claudio. So um, in the beginning, there were applications. They are everywhere, but not all of them are mine. How can I trust an application? that it won't break my computer and it won't steal all of my valuable data and destroy all of my Twitter files. Determining the security of an application is quite essential. A malicious application runs on uh, a local machine, puts the machine at a very high risk because um, 
the machine and everything in it, for example, F1 here, is under the direct interference from um, F2, our um, malicious app right here. So that's when VMs come to rescue. So, uh, VM is, uh, VM stands for a virtual machine. A virtual machine is an emulation of a physical computer um, that is installed on software, which imitates hardware system. The end user would have the same experience in a VM as they would on any other um, physical computers. A virtual machine has its own gas operating system and it has the its own libraries, powers, and tools. So um, that uh, gives us the big downside of VMs. VMs um, it's, uh, is possible because it allows resources to be developed for it to have, to have, to have its own uh, operating systems and libraries and other binaries. But um, and putting an app in a VM is like putting it in quarantine. You can do all kinds of tests on it, but uh, it's potentially dangerous behaviors are going to be compared, uh, compared in the end, and our host will be in safe. Um, but since the, the cost of VMs is so high, we're going to look for another option, and containers are next. Um, like VMs, they contain the apps inside, so we can keep our host machine safe. Um, but a uh, container is much lighter than uh, a virtual machine because they uh, can share the uh, host operating system and the libraries and binaries. So containers are, uh, in, a, uh, in a efficiency point of view, the best way to run an application. Of unknown nature. Um, there are several things that we are interested in. Um, the first one is the interaction between the app and the computer. The second one is the interaction between the computer and the environment. And the third one is the one between the um, computer itself. The reason that we look at those, um, uh, those interactions is to understand behaviors and establish trust. If the behavior being known and acceptable, then trust can be uh, established. Then we can trust the behavior. Uh, Any deviation from known and acceptable, uh, acceptable behaviors um, might give us hints. Uh, it means that trust is broken. So for this project, we are mostly going to be looking at the first interaction, which is the uh, interaction uh, the uh, interactions per, uh, provide us with a way to see the behaviors of an application. If we can classify the applications with machine learning, we can identify a tool and its behavior. We, monitor, we can monitor the activities of an application using SMAs, which is a debugging tool that um, lists the interactions between processes and the kernel, which include system calls, system deliveries, and changes of process state. So this is an example of an ASCII's output uh, on the um, Unix command state, uh, which just gives you the date of uh, the current date at the moment. So this is only um, part of as you can see, it uh, tells you um, what the behaviors of an application look like. Um, for example, uh, it has to do with execution and uh, some memory is being allocated and uh, it's trying to access a library. Um, so it tells us what the behavior of an application look, uh, will look like. But this is, this is all very good, but um, we want to create something to enough to feature our um, machine learning algorithm. We will have to define what good and bad um, behaviors are 
then we know what uh, when something is, uh, is wrong. So um, we are trying to utilize S trace to help us to um, establish trust. S trace help uh, helps us understand the processes uh, of the interactions between the processes and the kernel. Um, so we create the megawords from the S trace. For example, we don't really need a parameter because, um, for example, for date, um, we want to make sure that date at 5 p.m. and date at 2 a.m. will be classified as the same form. So parameters here is unnecessary. Therefore, we will only keep on the system calls here. So um, first of all, how we create the words, first of all, we only keep the calls. And uh, traditionally, um, machine learning based on time frequency is not enough because um, we want to preserve the order of the system calls because um, this file, it's a file is supposed to be um, writing something at this stage, but instead it's uh, trying to it uh, uh, keeps trying to access some files that we shouldn't, but we know it's abnormal. Therefore, the order is important, and we want to catch that. So um, we preserve the order by linking them, by linking all the um, system calls, but, uh, putting a dash between every two system calls. Um, uh, at this stage, we only have a very long matter word consisting of all the system calls. We want to break them into smaller words so that um, it, will, it can be tracked into machine learning, um, machine learning language. So we break the, the, uh, we break the uh, giant matter word into smaller words by break at um, every memory related system calls. That's, for example, the MNAP. Here. We decided to break out memory of the system calls because um, basically every call will need to um, allocate some memory at some time. So this is what the network will look like after we put them into smaller words. Some of them will, most of them are not distorted. So after we've generated the um, networks, we feed them. Uh, we use Weka to a suite, a suite of machine learning software to train classifiers that we can use to identify tools. So here are the two classifiers that we use. The first one is KNN, where um, an object is being assigned to the class most common uh, amount is K nearest neighbor, where K is uh, arbitrary. After we chose human as our classifiers, there are a few options that we chose. Um, we use the string to word vector filter, which converts out of the string of our vector words into attributes of um, work on occurrences. And then we do our distance weight, which is no distance weight, and the nearest neighbor search how we can assume it. Um, for SVN, uh, SVN uh, is basically a hybrid plan will be constructed uh, to classify two classes. And this hybrid plan is usually best constructed where it has the largest distance from the training data, uh, from the nearest training data point of any class. So with this, uh, we also chose screen to work. There are also some practical limitations from Recap. For example, we cannot, it doesn't deal with um, big data files very well. It's, um, one time I had a, um, a data file um, consisting of four megabytes files, and it took a whole day to run in that data and eventually crashed. So um, 
uh, and thanks to um, Tim, uh, he helped me um, to increase the memory. But uh, so it didn't generate any error saying that we are out of memory. But uh, it still didn't, uh, and no result have, have come out of uh, that like after running for the day. So eventually I had to stop it. So there's there uh, there are some of the limitations of that. So this is the results that um, we have in Italy. Um, so uh, this is uh, all the model words that I uh, created from different Linux commands. I just I just run as trace on the demo author and created the networks from the S trace output by that point. So um, from this result, you can see that some of it has almost like perfect successful of uh, identifying the flow. Uh, but notice that here for flow, it's not uh, perfect. It's actually uh, successful, it's much lower. This is because for other, uh, we, um, if for app, for example, for normal, we just uh, Use some no, we just try to generate some known behaviors that we know are acceptable. And for abnormal, we will, I will just maybe break the syntax on purpose or like um, transfer CPU. I will try to um, copy some file that uh, I should have access to, and or I'll copy the file to some, some uh, place that I don't have any space left anymore. So um, for those, the errors might be very different from what the normal uh, behavior would look like. But the flow, we define uh, this, we define the abnormal as um, pulling a website that is um, not functioning. So for example, normal would be this, uh, well, for normal, would uh, generate that the same, uh, an author saying that this uh, website is functioning okay. But for abnormal ones, it might say um, this, uh, there's no connection or um, this uh, website is down or something. But they will all uh, have an exit code of zero. And I, I believe that their computers are very similar. That is why um, the success rate of the internet. And uh, there are some outliers over here and there. Um, I'm thinking that if I try to balance the, um, the data files, the amount of data files in normal and normal, this might be um, better. But it's uh, because of the um, inherent difficulty in collecting some of the abnormal behaviors. Get so um, many uh, abnormal behaviors in time. So, um, uh, the, the uh, reason that we chose those, uh, the, uh, the nets here is because they are all very well known and widely used, and some of them are actually part of um, some medical, biomedical software, for example. Uh, and very similar assumptions of some biomedical software. And the complex, uh, complexity of some is actually comparable to real biomedical software, but with much higher maturity. And that is uh, also a reason for why um, the success rate is so high, because those events are really mature already. It's been perfected over the decades. So the same methodology that we used to classify those commands will work on um, biomedical software. So for future directions, um, I'm hoping to collect more data from different kinds of software, especially from biomedical software. And um, I'm well, we are going to further explore the interaction between containers and host. And um, and between uh, individual containers and between a group of containers 
So how, how do you generate those uh, ground truths in your result? The, the, yeah, the, 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 the ground truth is a human table that the yeah, you classify the things as uh, a, a to P. Oh, yeah, this is just a label that we can do to all but how, how do you know this label is correct or not? So, so the human the label. Um, oh, uh, so we know those, those, for example, normal behaviors are generated from known behaviors that we, we already know are correct. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Elizabeth Gordo, and I'm a high school intern from the Police School UCC. I want to start off by introducing my mentors, Gina Ha and Yin Zhang. My project is about decisional needs and WebMD online diabetes community. Before I get in depth with my project, I would like to introduce you guys my agenda, which is what my PowerPoint uh, includes. It is my learning goals, my background, methods, findings, and lastly, acknowledgement. So throughout interning here, I had several goals. The three most important ones being developing qualitative content analysis codebook, calculating integrator reliability, and conducting data analysis. So some background about diabetes is diabetes is a chronic condition characterized by elevated levels of blood sugar. One in every 11 people have diabetes. Managing diabetes can be overwhelming for several people, for most of the patients, because it's hard due to its day to day care. Its day to day care includes monitoring blood sugar throughout the day, eating a diabetes friendly diet, taking certain medications, and also having a lot of visits to the doctor. So, now about online health communities. As diabetes patients manage their conditions, they make decisions on a day to day basis. According to Pew Internet Research Center, 51% of American adults with a chronic disease search for health information online. Um, online health communities are places where people ask and share information, which brings up our research question. How do patients make decisions through online diabetes communities?
To answer the research question, we employ qualitative content analysis methods. While the details here are hard to see, I wanted to show you guys the process which, including, which included getting data from the database, filtering and, and out posts based on exclusion and exclusion inclusion criteria, and also sampling strategy. After all, we acquired all of this, we, we were left with a thousand thread initiating posts that were authored by non-moderator members for analysis. So now how we coded the 1,000 that we had. First, we uh, coded 50 posts together so that we could finalize our code book and make sure the codes fit properly to the post. Then we were um, giving 50 posts independently so that we can calculate our inter-rater reliability, which I will go in depth later on. Uh, and our kappa was 0.8. After we got a, a good agreement based on our Cohen's kappa, we divided the rest of the post, which was 450 each. So developing the codebook. We developed the codebook based on prior research and based on the first 50 posts that we coded. This is an example of one of our codes, which was topic group. Topic group was based on what the uh, codes are mostly about. These are some of the codes we used. We used MT for medical medication and treatment. T for procedure, DT for devices and tools, and so on. So now for an actual look at the code book, this is my example. Another code is relevancy. Uh, we coded relevancy for the post, not only if it solicited an input, but it also had to be about diabetes care, including its everyday lifestyles, behaviors, including exercise and other contributions to diabetes. We coded zero for relevancy and one for relevancy. These are some examples of some that were relevant and irrelevant. One that stood out that was irrelevant was titled, What is a blog? Mm -hmm. She states, is it, is it same as an email or what? I don't understand. As you guys can see, it does solicit an input, but it never doesn't mention anything with diabetes care or no type of contribution. So as mentioned before, I used, we used integrator reliability to see how good our agreement was based off of the codes. We came up with this chart, which shows how Raider 1 said yes to 21, Raider 2, me, said yes to 24, and so on. And then we did the math in, uh, using the Cohen's Kappa equation, and we came up with 0.8, which was a good agreement. And once we did this, we were able to fully really divide the codes. The discrepancy resolution. Just like we did have a good agreement based on Coleman's Kappa, we also had disagreements. So um, we took the side of the ones we disagreed on and we did discrepancy resolution. Once we, uh, we wrote the discrepancy on this example, it was relevancy. R1 coded irrelevant, R2 coded relevant. And we had to come up with a solution. We reviewed that the post together and decided it is not relevant because it is not solicit in your So now I'll show you guys some graphs from the uh, post we acquired. So here, this is all the 1,000 graphs. This shows the relevant ones. This shows the irrelevant ones. And these are the ones that we mostly focus on because they were both decision-making and relevant, which is 20% out of the For my next graph, what do topics do online diabetes community members make decisions on? Here we made a graph that show that is based off of the 20% that I previously showed, the red section, and it shows the topics that were mostly mentioned and also the ones that were least mentioned. The ones that were mostly mentioned being medication and treatment, blood sugar management, food, the ones that were least mentioned, sugar and sugar substitutes, alcoholic drinks, apparel and footwear. Now for my next graph. What triggers online diabetes community members to make such decisions? One of the codings we used was triggers. Triggers being what made them go out and want to post on online health communities. What, what made them make this choice? The biggest triggers that we saw 
was blood sugar problems, desire for information, and forming goals. The least triggers that the members used was the sign for life normality, critical events, others, and costs. So now for the conclusion of the project. For our contribution, we examined the decisional needs of diabetes expressed through online communities. We performed qualitative content analysis and uncovered the problems of decisional makers, as well as the context surrounds the, the, the decisional needs, such as topics, triggers. Our contribution guides us to develop solutions to meet their needs. For future directions, the responses to the questions regarding decisional makings will be evaluated in collaboration with a health professional. We will access the quality of information and create interaction that can um, improve decisional making. Now regarding my future directions, um, in August, I will attend UC Merced with a major in mechanical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> And now lastly, I'd like to thank everyone who gave me the opportunity and made this possible, including IDASH Internship Program, DBMI Department, Chao Chen Yang, Yina He, Ying Zhang, Sidon Volkar, Lizbeth Escobedo, Tomas Ano Machado, and everyone else who helped me through this process. Thank you for listening. The door is open for any questions. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what we created, created a topic, a different topic, a different triggers, whether um, how many choices they had, and all that. Yeah, we focus on the relevant ones, not the relevant ones. Yeah, I'm surprised to see the relevant ones too much. Yeah, they're relevant. Okay, I'll speak up. Uh, my name is Alex. As Xiao Mix has started, I'll introduce myself. I'm a master's student at the University of Washington. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about my project. Sorry, folks on the phone. Okay, yep. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about my project, Unsupervised Methods for Finding Progression Stages in Time Evolving Sequences. So, my team is myself. And my mentor, Dr. Benoni, who is a postdoc researcher here at UCSD. I love the photos. So today I'll talk to you about our project motivation and goals, uh, the definition of the problem and the challenges that we face, our approach and findings thus far, and then our plans for the future. So the motivation for this project stems from chronic diseases. Uh, in the U.S. alone, about half of the adults have one or more chronic diseases. And these diseases, of course, progress over a long period of time, causing a huge emotional and financial burden for patients, their families, and the health healthcare system. So our goal with this project is to aim, or is to model the progression stages of these chronic diseases. And we expect that this could be used for things like predictions, where you look at a patient's diagnoses and then determine what may happen to them in the future or what has happened in the past. Um, additionally, we think this could be used for things like error detection, where you notice that someone's entered an incorrect code along the way, um, perhaps forgotten to enter a code, or even for things like clinical trials and drug development to see what changes are happening in a patient and how that compares to the changes you'd expect to see. So, the problem definition, once again, we're looking at chronic diseases. And so there's things like diabetes, which was just mentioned, or Alzheimer's, which doctors and researchers have found progress through certain stages. And each stage is characterized by different symptoms um, that the patient has. And of course, these symptoms change along the way, and that's how a patient progresses through these stages. Now, the challenges that we face are, there's a few of them. One is that we're using electronic health records, which are very comprehensive and give us a lot of data, but of course there's a challenge in knowing what data to use and also just parsing through that amount. 
Um, additionally, there are some challenges that we found, such as the heterogeneity of patient conditions. So different patients can go through the same stages, but progress at different rates or progress differently. Uh, perhaps they somehow skip a stage or they're just not observed as having seen that stage. Perhaps they show different symptoms along the way. Um, in addition, we found a lot of the records were incomplete or irregular. Um, because we were looking at hospital data, it's possible that patients go to different hospitals along the way or perhaps just even don't go to the hospital until things get good. Um, finally, we found that um, for some diseases, there's very limited knowledge, and it's hard to incorporate the knowledge, and it's not a trivial task. So even for the diseases where we have that knowledge available, figuring out how to incorporate it proves to be a challenge. So our approach to this problem is that we start with our electronic health records. This includes things like a patient's medications, lab tests, chart events, etc. And we first take, so we take the, the data, we get each patient sequence, and then we group the patients together. And our assumption here is that patients who have a similar disease or the same disease should progress through a similar set of sequences. And even for patients who we see have missing data, we still expect that they should have this stage somewhere along the way. Now, after we group the patients together based on similarity, we look at each patient, seg uh, each patient sequence and segment it based on time and similarity. So time being events occurring after each other and similarity, which I'll talk about a bit later. Finally, we use what we found from the patient data and we try to learn the hidden stages that may be there persistent in this disease for these patients. Now, one other assumption that we made, in addition to the similarity of patients, is that if you look at data at different times, that should give us some sort of useful information about the stages of this disease. And we found that by looking at groups of patients rather than individuals, we'd be able to have more knowledge about a particular disease because we could see more information than we'd get from just one patient. So the data we use for this is called MIMIC. Um, it is a set of de-identified health records from patients who went to the intensive care unit at Beth Israel in Boston. And this data includes a lot of information. It includes the medications, the vital signs, um, all of the lab results, et cetera. But we focus just on the primary diagnosis, which is the diagnosis that they're given um, and assigned to have at the time of discharge. And we look only at patients with multiple visits, so we're trying to look at temporal sequences of health data. So this gave us about 6,500 patient records and over 17,000 total diagnoses over the course of 12 years. Okay, so to dive a bit deeper into our approach, for the grouping, we said that patients who are similar should be put in the same group together. Makes sense. Now, the way that we determined the similarity was by looking at patterns across patients. So we assumed that if patients had a number and a long sequence of events in common, then they should be put together in the same group. So what we use is called the longest common subsequence. So for example, let's say I have these two patients, patient A and patient B. For patient A, I can see the first diagnosis is 41040. The second is 414, I'll skip over that. Look at the third, which is 431, and the fourth, which is this 572. Now in the second patient, I see these same three codes in the same order. So even though the first patient skips over one, we're looking at just the progression along the way. So because we see the same three codes in the same order, we say that the longest common subsequence is a length of then from here, to determine similarity, we simply take the length of that, which is 3, and then divide it by the minimum length of either sequence, so in this case. So these two sequences, we would say, have a similarity of 1, so 100. Now, after determining the similarity for all of the patients, uh, I explored a few different machine learning algorithms to actually cluster them together. So the first two, BB scan and HBB scan, are quite similar. 
Um, essentially, they work by looking at each item, finding the nearest neighbors, and then repeating this for the entire set of them. Affinity propagation, the third, uh, looks at each item, determines if it could be what's called an exemplar for other items, so something that would be a very good representation of the items around it, and then repeats that for them. And then, of course, after clustering, you look to find the common diseases in that. Now, to give you an idea of what this data looks like in terms of clustering, this is a dendrogram, which is a tree-like diagram for hierarchical clustering. So we didn't use this kind of clustering, but this image gives you a sense of the sparsity and the noise in the data we have. So each of these branches represents what could be a different cluster, and you see that they go down very far to give you really small amounts. So we expect to see a lot of clusters with a small amount of data in each cluster. And this section in the middle, all of the black, represents the noise. So the data is very noisy. We have a lot of different patient sequences. So as mentioned, we looked at three different algorithms. And the way we analyzed this was with a quantitative measure called the silhouette score. This is just a number that represents how similar an item is to its own cluster versus others. The best score is one, which means it's certainly in the right cluster. And then the worst is minus one, which means it's in the wrong cluster. So for each algorithm, we looked at the number of clusters we got, the average score overall, the size of the best cluster, and the score for that best cluster. Now we chose to use affinity propagation, this bottom one, and I'll make a few notes about that. So first, it has a lot more clusters than the other. But if you think back to the image before, it makes sense because the data is so noisy. And for DB scan and HDB scan, the N in both of those algorithms stands for noise. So they take all the noisy elements and just put it into one or two large clusters. Now, one reason we chose affinity propagation is because it has the best score overall. Additionally, the size of the best cluster is larger. And because we had such sparse data, we wanted to have enough patience to really try and find these patterns along the way. So even though the best silhouette score is a bit lower than the others, we could still go through and remove the items that were that have a negative score to indicate they may be incorrectly placed and still get about 99 sequences with a score of about zero point. So overall, we felt good with this because it gave us a larger number of patients that we could compare to segment. Now, after clustering, focus on the temporal segmentation. So here, we took each patient's sequence and tried to define the progression stages along the way. And our assumption is that events that happen closer to each other, so in succession of each other, should, or, and if they're similar, they should be grouped together into segments. So to guide this, I created a tree for the diagnosis code. So I showed some sequences before with codes in there. These are the codes that are used for a patient's diagnosis, and they're called ICD codes. And there's a giant list of them, and they're all set up in a huge hierarchy. So I built a program that would crawl a website that listed all of the codes, get their hierarchy information, and then create this tree-like structure based on all of that. So here, something like carcinoma in the stomach and carcinoma in the skin of the lip should be very similar. And so they're on the same level, very near the bottom of the tree. Whereas something like neoplasms versus mental disorders are quite dissimilar. So they're up towards the top of the tree in different notes. Of course, as you get lower down the tree, siblings become more similar. So we took that into account by building an exponential distance model as you move up. So, for segmentation, what we did was we looked at each sequence and we said, okay, let's find the closest pair of codes based on the ICD tree. And then we could, we could merge those together and replace them with the lowest common ancestor. So if I'm looking at the top sequence, even just by looking, we could assume that the 42843 and 42823 are the closest. So, we group those together and replace them with their lowest common ancestor, which is 420. Now we repeat that process again. So looking again, we can say, okay, 427.1 and 428. Those are quite close. 
So let's replace them with their lowest common ancestor. And we repeat this process until a maximum distance has been reached. And we also have been thinking about repeating this process instead until we have a certain number of segments, particularly for diseases that we know have a certain number of segments. So here is the original sequence again, and you can see we have segments one, two, and three. And these would be then the progression stages of this patient. Now, our results for segmenting were interesting. We found that most patients were segmented into either one or two stages. And some clusters, for example, myocardial infarction, nearly every patient was clustered into this one state for ischemic heart disease. And this made sense based on the codes being so similar. Um, but this indicated to us that maybe using just the primary diagnosis code is not enough. So we want to explore looking at additional features such as the time, the secondary diagnosis code, maybe medication or lab results. In addition, because the data we're using is from the intensive care unit, we feel that it may not be the best representation of chronic diseases. So we may want to look into data from doctor's office or even from a hospital, but not limited to the intensive Now, looking forward, we've not yet uh, gotten to this, but plan this in the next few weeks, is that once we have the data clustered and segmented, we want to build a progression model. And so this is essentially finding the hidden stages using the observations we find from patients. And our motivation here is that the similarities between the groups will help us determine these states that might not have been known before. So for example, we can have a cluster of patients as shown, and maybe a disease that we know has a certain number of stages, or we believe may have a certain number of stages. We could look at the observations we have from patients, line up all the segments based on their similarity, and then determine what these stages actually look like based on what we see in the patient. So in addition to building that progression model, in the future we'll be, once again, um, using additional features and different information for clustering and or segmenting. Um, we also would like to work with clinicians to evaluate the system's results and to see if the segments make sense and if the clustering does as well. Now to share with you some of my personal takeaways, um, being here has been great. I've learned a lot. I've found that research can be difficult, but it's very rewarding. Um, the work is quite different than what I've done before, but I enjoy having more freedom in what I do. And uh, once again, I've learned a lot. Um, there's a variety of ways in which health data can be used. I know Lucilla talked about this earlier in her presentation, uh, just the possibilities that we have with data, even with something like this small project where we talk about predictions, and I think about how that could uh, change the healthcare for people along the way, improve their financial state, et cetera. Um, finally, I've learned that skills that I've learned in my program with computational linguistics can be applied to much more than just text. So things like clustering and parsing, here I use it for health data and diagnosis codes rather than just text. And finally, choosing the right clustering algorithm is important. We explored a few different models and took some time to really analyze those, but I think it was important because the outputs are so different. And knowing what you want makes it important to know which algorithm. Finally, I would like to give a big thank you to my mentor, Luca. He has been uh, great help along the way. Also, my advisor at the University of Washington, Xiao Chen Min Phil, if anything is possible, the other interns and staff, uh, the Department of Biomedical Informatics, and finally, the NI. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So you are grouping those ICD-9 code. Yes. Uh, you, you say you can uh, repeat the steps into the maximum distance. Yes. Uh, so how, how do you define those maximum? Yes. So what we did for the distance was, do you mind if I pull the slide again? Sure. Mm -hmm. So what we did for the distance, initially we looked at just a linear distance. So something like, okay, every time you move up, it's just one. Um, but we found that that didn't work because, of course, the distance, the maximum distance changes as you go up. 
So we implemented instead an exponential model so that the distance between something like this and this would be one, let's say this would be two, and then here would be four, and then eight. Um, and so by just having a simple, you know, two to the whatever exponential model, then the distance increases as you go up, which makes sense. And then our maximum distance threshold keeps everything at the same level. That's a great that's a great question. So yes, the method that we're using now, they would still get the similarity of one because we're looking at just having the same codes in the same order. Um, it's definitely something that we can consider adapting with the future. Um, I mean, right now the clusters look like they make sense in the sense that you know they're separated into something like subarachnoid hemorrhage or something, and everyone in that group has that kind of hemorrhage, so it does make sense. Um, but I think there definitely is room for improvement on that question. Uh, so yeah, we're just looking at the two next to each other, and then right two meters. Well, so we're yeah. using, so we're going through, we're taking whatever has the minimum distance yeah. of the whole thing, and then we're doing that. And then, right, but we're always looking at ones next to each other because we want to take the time. We definitely could. I think, um, so because everyone's from the same hospital, um, they, they do have information about like, their ethnicity and feelings, yeah. so that could definitely be interesting. Um, that was one other thought that we had. So I think we will have pizza delivery in this room. So the summer is long, but it's also a very short. Uh, I really wanted to have all of you stay longer with us. This is a very successful internship program. And uh, I've been very proud to be uh, able to contribute to this um, for, since, since uh, 2011. And uh, since we have this program, uh, we actually covered both steps and uh, deeps uh, into expertise in different uh, area. And uh, our input is from all your these creative young minds. And uh, we have outputs. We get papers, abstracts, posters, too. Uh, so this is introduced uh, within the last six years. We actually had like a uh, certain papers published uh, from our intern group. But coming by Protecto, we are actually uh, highly, highly productive for the 10 week long uh, internship. And uh, uh, so some of our previous uh, interns uh, become faculty. Uh, postdoc and uh, some become uh, research assistant and program manager and we always like to uh, welcome you back and uh, uh, we hope we will bring Adash uh, 2018 back uh, with opportunity funding so stay tuned and uh,
uh, spread the word to your friends and uh, colleagues, and uh, hopefully you can apply and join us uh, next time. So we're not boring, uh, besides <laughs> the research, uh, we also do fun stuff together. So this year we had a kayak uh, at La Jolla Cove. Actually, this is my first kayak, so uh, I really enjoyed the <laughs> opportunity <laughs> to be with the team. It was really fun. And, uh, we were uh, like uh, uh, paddling and we also watched golfing and uh, see uh, the cave where uh, the, the baby uh, sea lions. Uh, so it's really nice. And so finally, uh, let me uh, extend my sincere thanks to all the advisors, all the interns, trainees, and the NIH people who stayed online uh, listening to us for the morning. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending.